This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. Coming up on the payoff, Jason Williams and Mike Jaminski probably been in each other's laps for more than 30 years. In 1991, when Jason came into the NBA, he joined the Philadelphia 76ers where Mike Jaminski was the mentor, the veteran. 30 years later, after Jason had experienced his own tragedy and had gotten sober, Mike Jaminski was experiencing his version of tragedy. And when G-Man hit his bottom, Jason was there to help him rebound. Literally. Rebound Institute in Florida is saving the lives of people who need the help and want it. It's outdoor adventure therapy, and it's just pure joy talking to G-Man and talking to Jason Williams about sobriety. We know Jason's story, right? That's not what this is about. This isn't 60 Minutes. This is a program about recovery and where people are today. And where Mike and Jason are is in Florida, helping other people stay sober just like themselves. These guys are hilarious together. Uh, Jason, known for his big personality. It was just like, for me, such a trip to talk to these two guys. And at the end, I got a little emotional. I was a kid hunkering down watching them play every night for the Sixers. And Jason, I watched him play a lot at St. John's. And here I was talking to them about sobriety. At the beginning, just to catch up, uh, we talk about Lou Karnaseka, Jason's coach at St. John's, a father figure to him. Just an all-time historic basketball coach. It's enough out of me. Let's get to my man, Kevin Souza. my day Peter by at, at about three o'clock and then uh I'm in the gym at 4 45 um and so I gotta wait on these guys to get up I actually I just called coach called a second 8 15 and he goes who died oh, oh, you know and he goes oh Jason he goes you probably already got five hours and I go yeah coach so I, I keep in touch with all those guys matter of fact I just got inducted into the hall of fame I bet Coach Karnasek is so so like proud of you because I, I would imagine. Oh yeah, you guys he, he tells you all the time, "Mom, his favorite." Chris Mullen hates to talk, hear that, but it's the truth. <laughs> it is the truth. See, yeah. I grew up as a kid. I grew up right outside Philly, so okay, I, I was a big Villanova guy. So you right. were you were on my radar. I grew up watching you play uh, in, in Villanova and with the Sixers, and I, I I worked for the Sixers for a little while. I did PR, so I worked for for Jimmy Lynham. Uh, oh, you know, man. I was there when, when Cheeks was a coach and, right. uh, you know, Jimmy was always just real cool. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy's the greatest. He goes the greatest. What up? Hey, G man, what's happening? It's all you brother. Oh, dude. I, re- I really appreciate you guys making the time. Oh, no problem. We hope you save some lives today. That's what I'm talking about. And G man, I want to give you a thank you first. Uh, so Jason, I'm doing. I do I do TV news here in Texas, and I do okay. I do play by play stuff for ESPN. And G Man hooked me up with a buddy of his, Rob, uh, at Raycom, and uh, I had a great talk with him. And I'm getting I've gotten a couple football games this year, Mike. I got I did the Baylor opener, and I'm doing Oklahoma State uh, this coming weekend. So uh, we're, we're moving uh, and grooving. Yeah, I'll um I'll give you my address. Ten percent will be good. For you. <laughs> <laughs> Jason said it was eight, and he gets the other two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I don't want to take too much of your guys' time, but I want to start with with your guys' journey together. I was talking to Jason, Mike. I'm a, I'm a, I grew up a Villanova guy, and of course, I'm a, a Sixers fan. Uh, you guys both were on my radar. Jason is a college player, Mike as a pro, and uh, you know, here we have it's 1991. Jason, you get drafted in, in, into the NBA out of St. John's, and you show up to play for the Sixers, and. What, what is that environment like? What was that team like? Well, first of all, let me tell you something. I got my first autograph from Ed Pinckney, Gary McClain, uh, at the Big East tournament in Madison Square Garden. And I watched them play, and I was like, I am going to Villanova. And then I was like, well, I might go to UCLA until I found out that UCLA was a university the corner of Lexington Avenue. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> 
and, and then Villanova wasn't in New York City uh, because I thought if you're playing in Madison Square Garden, like you have to be in New York City. When I found out it was outside of Philly, I was like, oh no, uh, it's just way too far for me to leave my parents. Uh, but as far as Uh, I didn't know where Villanova was when they drafted me to Phoenix. You know, I wasn't going there. You know, uh, a, a funny story was well, not too funny. I guess it could be funny now. But when they drafted me, um, they told me that I'd go anywhere from five to 25 because I had a broken foot. But my dad was there at Coach Connor Secker's, uh, uh in his office, and we didn't go to the car. So I, every time the number five would come up, they drafted Mark. Kessler, my dad would be, yeah. I mean, no, that ain't me, dad. He's like, don't worry about it. You be next. You know, number nine come. Blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about it. Jay, I, dad, you be next. You know? and then I did a double take back, like on number 20, when they still didn't pick me. And I just went like this and then went back to my father telling my mother, see, I'm going to be laying bricks the rest of my damn life. Ain't nobody ever going to pick him. You know? <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. And then if I so I heard from my agent that I'm going 22nd to the, to the New Jersey Nets where my dad lives in Newark. We work, work in Newark, so it's going to be great. Um, I'm staying home, and then the Phoenix Suns picked me. And I was like, Phoenix Suns? And I'm not going out there. Nothing but some mm-mm, driving pickups, no teeth in that mouth, having buzz buzz. <laughs> and oh, my God, Pete, oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, they had it on the big Tron up in Phoenix. And all the people that came in were watching it, like 20,000 people, and they started booing me. <laughs> Ooh. And even today, 20 some years later, I still go to Phoenix and they still lose my luggage. <laughs> was that so, was that a draft day trade that got you to Philly? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I just held out. They were like, well, we're not going to trade you. And they finally just said, you know, this guy is for real. He's not coming to Phoenix. Um, and they ended up trading me to Philadelphia which brings us to your original <laughs> yeah. So you so you, you were around. so you were like I'm not I'm not playing in Phoenix which by the way no. guys had started to do whether it was football you saw John Elway did it where would say hey I'm not going to play in Baltimore so don't even right. bother drafting me uh, and, and organizations were starting to it's like the beginning of player empowerment right organizations were starting right. to realize these guys aren't screwing around right I I was definitely not playing around you know I was definitely you know I I lost three sisters um, so I'm very protective of my parents. I don't tell everybody this, but I tell you, Pete, that I slept with my parents when I was 15. Not that I was scared, but just scared that something might happen to them. Uh, so uh, as far as leaving them, that wasn't going to happen. And then I get dr- traded to the Philadelphia 76ers coming from St. John's and Luke Conaseca, where before they put the rule in, we practiced for six hours. <laughs> uh, six hours a day. He was 90 then. <laughs> you know, so he had nowhere to go. Uh, and adopted two. My sisters had died, and I adopted their kids in college. And um, so when I finished up with them at St. John's, uh, and I got drafted and then traded, uh, my dad, uh, I said, Dad, we're gonna have to go to Philadelphia. He goes, well, closer than Arizona. And uh, the first person uh, I meet is is G Man here, and they assigned. G man to me, uh, you know, I, I'm assigned to G man. Mike, so, you're shaking like, your head. Yeah. Uh. So he's the first person that. So you got Charles Barkley, you got the rest of the team, Pete, and then uh, they get this wild kid from New York, and you can see, uh, you know, G man. Uh, you know, he been did, put it like this. He been down south too long, you know. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I'll let you tell him some of the story, but I want to take up all the time. But no, but Mike, what was your first impression of Jason? Well, first of all, Pete, um, you know, one, one of my great pleasures in broadcasting is working with Tim Brando. He's yeah. been my main partner. And and Tim is very loquacious, um, <laughs> you know, so I have to fight. And I'm, I'm used to being here in a non-speaking role, which apparently I am today as well. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, Jason coming in was like a, he was like an unbroken cult. You know, it's so much talent, uh, so much enthusiasm. Uh, we didn't see him all that much his rookie year down in Philly. He kept going back up to New York all the time. Um, and, you know, but and, and the thing you saw about when when uh, back then, when when hazing was when rookies hadn't taken over the league and hazing was still, 
you know, something you did. Every every vet got a rookie in training camp, and they had to get bring them uh, newspaper and coffee, and we, you know, just run little errands for us. And uh, so, you know, Jay was we had him moving around a lot his his uh, his rookie year. And uh, actually, through that story, we should have had a T-shirt made up that said "You'll be next" <laughs> in, in the draft. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was you know what um those philly teams were m- my favorites of the, the teams that i played with in the league i'm such a, a great group of guys and you know and jay was we had hersey hawkins um it was a it was an older team though it was a veteran team um Mahorn, was, was Mahorn still there yeah uh mo got traded uh johnny dawkins was there i think at that okay. point and um, but, you know, it was a little tough environment for Jay to come into. It was older guys were married. Um, but, you know, <laughs> tell a funny story. Um, uh, you know, I got had the great pleasure to meet his dad uh, a few times and he came down to Philly. It was his rip for for told me this afterwards. His dad went over to him and he said, you know, why don't you hang around G-Man a little bit more and less around Barkley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My dad's was in South Carolina and everything was plural for him. You know? <laughs> uh, he's like, look, 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 leave the leave Charles Charles alone. Leave me leave Charles alone. Leave him alone. He's like, mess with the G-Man. The G-Man is where that. You know? <laughs> That's a true story. So he put me under his wing, uh, Pete. But what ended up being is that I ended up really living in New York. People who thought I was living in, in South Jersey, I would actually, when the game was over, you know, be in New York, uh, you know, drinking and doing carrying on until the wee hours of the morning and then getting a little rest and coming back for the games. Um, and that really set me back uh, for at least a season. And Because, look, you play for Coach Connor Secker, you go to practice, then you go to study hall. Um, and then, you know, I had my children I had to watch, my sister's kids, which I adopted. Uh, so it was a lot of things we had to do with structure. I remember asking G-Man after breakfast, which was only 45 minutes, and I was like, was, was this the warm-up? He's like, no, this is it. I go, what do we do now? You know, Charles Barkley said, we go to the bar. Right? And I was like, what? You know, and, 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 and this is a true story. So I didn't, I played with Charles Barkley for two years. I love Charles Barkley, the one of the greatest human beings ever, got the biggest heart, would give you his shirt off his back. But when it came to practice, uh-uh. You know, I literally would go out all night with him and then couldn't understand how he can get 25 points and 20 rebounds every night after being out all night. It's because we had to practice. So he'll come in, and, and he had this thing for McDonald's. He'll take a hot cake, and he'll roll it up with syrup and butter and sausage and roll it up like this and put a Diet Pepsi there and get on the stationary bike and roll like a half. He pedaled a half a mile an hour and be like, Run the floor! And we're practicing run. I said, run the floor. That's why we can't win no game. And pancakes will be spitting out of his mouth. <laughs> but I mean, Pete, and I will say this, that, you know, I love Charles, and he's been such a big help to me in, in my recovery. And um, But of, of all the great that I knew time in the NBA, he was a terrible practice player. I mean, Jay did not lie about that. But we used to be able to embarrass him in the, in the practicing like 75 percent of the time and we had a guy named Derek smith who oh sure was a kind Number of a leader of the team and Derek would get into him and he you know we'd get the best out of charles but there were just some times that just wasn't happening jimmy lineman would say all right just go over and ride the bike you know just you know get out of our way and we'll, we'll go and do our thing but um great teammates and you know all those guys uh, you know and the guy i'm sitting next to we're still close you know, Rick Mahorn and, and Johnny Dawkins is down here at UCF. And, uh, you know, it, it was just Jimmy Lynham really was a great coach in developing yeah. a team. Um, and we're still close today. Yeah. Yeah. Spoke to Jimmy last week. Jimmy is the best, you know, because it wasn't for Jimmy. I should have been out the league with all the shenanigans that were going on in my life at the time. I definitely wasn't focused. And, how, um, how did you how did you find the focus, Jay? Because you did you turned into an exceptional NBA player. How did you go from the guy in Philly that was living in New York to the guy that's signing a huge contract with the Nets and is one of the more colorful guys in the league? Well, what happened was they found a secret source, um, and that was they called Coach Connor Seca, and they said, look, we can't do anything with this guy. Only time he can do anything is when we get him really angry 
uh, in practice, and then that might be dangerous because he can get really physical, and we don't want nobody to get hurt. They said, um, what do we do? He goes, you know, uh, they said, so my dad said, what you do is he don't like to get embarrassed, so what you do is have people come to the practice, and then when they come to the practice, he going to play hard, and then that result in the game. And then my father started coming to the game, uh, and uh, then my father moved in with me, and uh, then he said, to a house. So how the boy you better start dribbling with your hands. You better start bouncing that basketball. <laughs> you said because uh, you're gonna need to maintain this house. You're gonna need to, you know, fund this house. So you know, the, and, and so he kept building the house bigger and bigger, and to be like thirty thousand square feet, uh, so I can keep playing hard. And uh, as long as they had my dad, and they found out I didn't want to disappoint my dad, then that's when everything turned around for me. You know, you know, Pete, and and being around Jay and. I, I can tell you that there are two men who are the most, by far the most important men in his life. And, and the way he talks about him first is dad, EJ and coach Karnaseka. And I, you know, I can't think of any other guys that he's spoken of more as being an influence in his life than those two. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I, well, look, I, I mentioned coach Karnaseka and, and, and Jay lit up like a Christmas tree. And I do want to say this from a sobriety perspective. I'm ha Usually we do this audio, but to be able to see the two of you guys next to each other uh, and, and you were just radiating, you're just glowing. Uh, it's, it, it, it is a, it's a beautiful thing. You feed, well, you feed off each other like we do in this whole recovery thing. And like you guys are doing in rebound. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of what I want to get to. That's, that's the meat of this. Mike, Go back to the NBA. You get traded uh, to Charlotte that mm -hmm. that first year, and do you keep in contact with Jason at all, or do you just you just you just play against them? No, what we well we we played against each other and and really kind of lost track. I mean, he got into some fights with J.R. Reed and teammates in Charlotte. There. Okay, yeah. No, 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 no. Let, me, let me tell you this story before yeah. you go any further. No, no. It's my first NBA start ever. They trade G Man, right? And uh, my new bowl is hurt, uh, and they go, Jay, you're starting today. Now, understand something, I have not played more than five minutes probably in my career, and now I'm finally starting, right? So I'm like, all right, let's go. Like, I'm, I'm like, Charles, whatever we need, whatever we need, we're going to win this game. And G-Man's down in Charlotte, and uh, I start, I run out, and at halftime, we're down 47 points. <laughs> 47 <laughs> points. So now my mind is gone. So I'm like, no more basketball. I'm back to the low east side. So let's fight. So um, J.R. Reed, who's a great player, great person, he comes running by a locker room. He's playing for the opposite team with the Hornets with, uh, with, with Mike. And he runs by a locker room and he goes, let's beat these bums by 50. And I was like, what? So my deflection, which we would do, right, with deflection. Right here. Jason cut out a little bit. The other player he was talking about, his teammate involved in this fight, was Charles Barkley. I'm like, get in the game, just take the ball, run JRE over, and then I'm going to work on everybody else. <laughs> and he was like, all right, let's do it. So him not even knowing, you know, that Jimmy Lyon heard us, the coach, I didn't even get in the game the second half. They didn't start me because Jimmy Lyon was like, no, I heard what you said. You're going to stay on the bench. So this is how important I am to the team. He don't even notice I'm not on the floor. So he gets the ball, and he runs J.R. Reed over, and J.R. jumps up, and the Hornets jump up on him. I'm on the other side of the bench, all the way 94 feet away. And he's looking at me like, where are you? On the court. I'm like, I'm over here. So I have to run the length of the court to get into a fight, which was like the last straw uh, for everything and everyone. So, I, so, the, so the end of the story is they did make some inroads. I think we beat them by 30. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, Pete, I, I, I played and then I was broadcasting when Jay was playing up in my alma mater my, with the Nets. And, uh, but – you know, we didn't really stay in touch after that because in, in 2002, the, the Hornets went to New Orleans and I switched over to college basketball broadcasting. And, I, you know, I, I've been in the ACC for 20 plus years now. Um, so I, I really, you know, I, I, I didn't really call Jay. We didn't have much interaction at all. 
uh, until uh, until July 14 of uh, 2020, when my life really turned around. And and by this time, Jason, your life is turned around, and you've started rebound uh, in, right. in, in in Florida. You know, you 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 basically hit the ground running, and. Mike, you, COVID hits, we've talked about it here on this podcast, you know, I was so lucky to have the opportunity to talk to you about it, and you shared with me the story, you, you have tragedy in your life, COVID hits, you're holed up, right, in, in, in your, your place in Charlotte, and you're just boozing, nonstop, nonstop. It was, I mean, it was the perfect invitation for me, Pete, I mean, you're telling me that I have to stay in my apartment, I can't go out, and, I ha- and I'm drinking, Why? this is great. You know, I don't have to, I just have to get myself a handle of vodka every day and, uh, you know, sit there and watch TV. It was a perfect storm. And, you know, fortunately for me, and, you know, at the time, unfortunately, my son, Noah, is witnessing all this. And he gets to the point where he's like, Dad, I, you know, he, he, you know, he, he said, I have to help him. And he had the intervention with me and, uh, you know, found out about Rebound and they put a computer in front of me, much like this. And I see people down there and they're like, you know, hey, we love you. We want to help you. And there were other people in my life who were on that intervention as well. Being there uh, with a glass of vodka doing the intervention. <laughs> yeah, whatever I was gets like, you there. I'm in. We'll get back to this conversation in a second. But right now, a word from our sponsors. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in. And, you know, the, the whole circle of life thing that, Jay came to me as a rookie, and I came to him in the worst possible shape of my life. And I was begging him to save my life, and he did. Jason, what, what was God, it? Yeah. Go ahead, Jack. Through the grace of God, we, you know, we saved Mike's life. And uh, Mike came down, and he was in some rough shape. I remember trying to get him out the car. <laughs> Woo! Oh, man. You know. they, told, they told me to drink on the way down, so I did. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Uh, uh, and, and I remember Mike just telling me, you know, and this is what I was so intimidated. The only person that ever come to rebound that intimidated was Mike because, look, I said, look, Mike used to tell me what to do. Now I'm going to have to tell him what to do. And I'm explaining to our staff, you know, our relationship, you know, and then, you know, we're up and go program here. So we're outdoor adventure therapy. That's why we're out here. Oh, everything goes on outside. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're skydiving, scuba diving, horseback riding, kayaking, paddle boarding, you know, with yoga, Everglades soar, hydro boarding. Uh, we're doing everything, basketball, pickleball, racquetball, everything outside. So, uh, and, and I went up to Mike. I was like, Mike, uh, it's five o'clock in the morning. Mike was like, and what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? I go, uh, you got to get up. You know, we go to the gym first. And then, uh, and he was like, bro, are you kidding me? You know, and uh, he starts off yelling and I go back out. I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then Mike comes, he calls me back. He goes, Jay, come back. He goes, I know you don't give anybody a breakdown here. And this is why I want to be here. He says, but I need about two or three days. And then I will be your best teammate. We don't call them clients down here. We don't call them patients because I'm in it with them. I'll be your best teammate ever. And uh, that's what we did. And after the third day, Mike started going. And now Mike's at two years in. This will be uh, 26 months tomorrow, matter of fact. Oh, gosh, uh, yeah. Um, and that's that's true fact, Pete. And, you know, and, and Jay was talking about the things down here that we do. And the essence, to me, the adventure therapy is the essence of what we do. And right. I remember in the in the intervention, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, what do you got? What is it? What do you do? And he says, well, you know what, this, that, that. And they say, and we go skydiving. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I'm in on everything, but there's no effing way <laughs> I'm jumping out of a plane. <laughs> so my second 30 days, I'm like, they, they wear me down. I'm like, all right, let's go. And, and you know what, I did it. And it was the most liberating well, thing that I've ever. Well, hold on, hold on. Before we get there, Mike goes the first time, and Mike's been drinking. After you know, you need more than thirty days. So, but Mike, you know, now he's sober, he's losing weight, he's getting out, he's acting. He's he, let's say that. And then we go to go skydiving. The guy goes, "You have to be under two seventy." And Mike wasn't under two seventy. And Mike competitiveness came out. NBA came right out, and he's like, "When's the next time I can go?" And they were like. Mike can go in 30 days. And Mike must have dropped, what, Mike, 30 pounds? Yeah. About 30 pounds in a month <laughs> to go skydiving. Here goes a man who did not want to go skydiving, had the perfect excuse 
I, I never know how you could drop a tank out of the air with a parachute and not <laughs> <Kaminsky>. uh, But <laughs> But Mike went in the gym, picked it up, started going 100%, and he hasn't looked back since. And, uh, you know, we, he got to the plane, he jumped out, and uh, and like you said, he just said that was one of his most liberating. You know, but the thing is that, and what all these things do down here and did for me was get me outside of my comfort zone. Right. And they build self esteem. I got to believe. Yeah, and well, when I when I got down, I mean, Jay can tell you, I was so full of adrenaline. I was calling people, telling them that I just skied over for the first time. But I was looking up at the clouds, saying, "You know what? I can do that. I can do anything." And, and that really cemented my resolve to remain sober. And I still do that. I look up in the sky and I, and I remember that day and it, it, it stays with me. It's such a, a huge part of what goes on down here, getting you outside of your comfort zone. What's it like? And Mike, go ahead, Jay. Well, I was going to say, Pete, like you're right now, you're on the couch, right? Yeah. Now, I don't beat down any other program because this is tough. You know, we only take five people in a month, five people starting five. I'm used to them numbers. Um, it fits nicely in the SUV and, uh, and, 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 and when we're going places, because look, you know, on the way to skydiving and, and, uh, it's just like a school, right? Well, you don't learn much in school. You learn most of the stuff on the school bus or the subway to school. That's when you learn the cool kids in the back. Those are usually going to be in treatment or, or, or they're gonna be in prison. The, the kids in the middle are usually going to stay in the middle. Kids in the front are going to run the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Never heard that. Yeah, Bible, you know, they, they're not having nothing to do with the middle or the back of the bus. <laughs> you know, so on the way there, you know, I'm we lay into each other around there. A lot of competitiveness um, comes out, and uh, you know, Mike is ticked off about having to do this, but he's doing it. Anxiety is going, and uh, we're telling him, "Hey, Mike, you know, uh, you know," and he's like, oh. and "I'm like, yo, be careful, you know, because if you go this way, you know, that's Okeechobee Lake." And there's gators in there like six no. feet, and the, the wind is gusting. He's... Yeah, and there's one of our one of our therapists here went out, and his the main chute didn't open for him. He, they had to go to the auxiliary chute, and they told me that story on the way out. You know, oh my so, gosh! I've been there to look at it that way. I will tell you one thing: when I got up in the plane, I was I was calm and I was ready to do it. But also, you talk about the NBA thing. I was when you're getting ready to jump, you have to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down until you're yeah. ready. And I was thought, oh, damn, if I was going to be landing in that plane to face these guys. I was <laughs> at that point, regardless. Uh, but that's the, that's the tone that they set down here to get you past those things. And Pete, like you're sitting there on your couch, right? We really can't get to know you or any other program when you're sitting in a room for 10 hours a day. You really don't get to know that person. You get to know them when you got to get them on the in the SUV on the way to the airport. They see the small plane. We're putting on the parachute, or we're going to the bottom of the ocean, or we're getting on a wave run at sixty miles an hour, or we're getting on our horses here. You get to really see the the, the person because they're out their comfort zone. They're going to do nineteen different activities in one month. They you most likely have never done, and taking you out your comfort zone. You know, look, I have and Mike. You know, we're not comparing, uh, I'm, I'm identifying. I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease. And I have the only disease that you can go to jail for. So me and Mike understand that. Our team understands that here. And, uh, you know, so we only have a short period of time to work with you. So when we, this energy that you see right now, it's been going since 4 o'clock this morning. Yeah. And it'll go on until 9 o'clock. And Mike will tell you this, look. Every once in a while, I, I I forget my phone or my keys or something, and I come back <laughs> and like into the thing because I'm going. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. You know, it's eight o'clock at night. You know, let's go do this. And everybody's like, "Man, we're doing just tired, Jason." So I come back in, and you will never see five adults pretend like they're sleeping. <laughs> I'm always sleeping. I will. I will tell you one thing, Pete. To add on to that, he does forget a lot of things, but he does not forget teammates and. The other thing, I knew I was in the right place when I saw how they cared for people after they left here. Because you don't leave it. There's a, there's a, there's a follow-up. There's a, every day there's a follow-up. And that, that's the other magical thing about this place. Um, it's not just 30, 60 days, see you later, cut the check. Um, you know, you're a teammate and you're a teammate for life here. Oh, yeah, we you, have, you are, we, you're we an have active a, member uh, of the roster, Mike. I mean, you're, you're yeah. down there right now working. And, and the cool thing about this is, 
you have opportunity. You're a national broadcaster. It's not like you're somebody who's like, I got nothing going. I'm doing this. Like you're choosing to do this because you get a lot out of it. And obviously, you know, it's, it's way worth your time. And I, and I think that's so cool. Well, and you know, when I, when I talk with Jen Jay is we're both very open about our stories that uh, we have a platform to use hey, when, when I got into sobriety, I wanted to control the narrative. Uh, I wanted to get out and speak about my story, uh, help other people like Jason started with Rebound down here. And now I'm, I'm lucky and, and humble and grateful enough to be a part of it, to, to use that and to, you know, to represent and, and try to help other people in their path like I've been helped. Mike, I want to ask you what, what, one thing real quick. When you are back, you hit the road again to start doing games, right? So you're back and forth from Rebound and you're traveling. How were you received? Because uh, because you were out there, you were public with with how Jason had helped you and how you were sober. How was that? I've had more people come up to me and ask me about my journey. You know, I, social media I don't pay a lot of attention to, so there I'm sure there are people killing me out there saying I'm a drunk. But you know, for the most part, the people that I interact with are very positive. They're they have family members who have issues. They're I've referred some people down here to rebound to, you know, help them on their path. I'm talking to people on the phone, family members of guys that I played with. Um, you know, the, the, re, the response to me has been overwhelming and I, I'm so very fortunate for it. And, and Jason and a lot, and Jason has, has taught me how to, how to deal with that, how to teach people, how to reach people. Uh, and, and it's been invaluable. Pete, let me just tell you to add on to that. You know, we've had over 300 alumni come through the program. And like Mike said, we speak to them every day. We have a video messaging app. Somebody has word of the day. Uh, and then we all have to respond. So just like this, you know, there's no email saying, oh, I'm sick today. Or there's no voicemail or text. We actually get to see you. And and, and it's like the Oxford modality. Uh, you know, the alumni run it and it's just professionally managed. But let me tell you something. We are, uh, you know, a program where we're very confidential. So a lot of people that come down don't want their names out there. And hopefully they do when they leave and they most likely do. They release that stigma um, because, look, unfortunately, if you have cancer, you go get chemo. Um, and if you're an addict, you come get treatment. And uh, one of the things that I've never seen down here in the eight years we've been doing this is all the fan mail that Mike got. You know, I don't even know the address. You know, Mike was getting so much stuff from Duke. And I'm not talking about, you know, first of all, I got a special call. And the call was from, you know, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, you know, when you hear that, David Stern was my guy. But I'm like, Adam Silver kind of probably didn't feel too good about me because me and David were so close. But then Adam called me. was like, I got somebody special coming down for you. I couldn't figure out what was the connection. You know, um, and then I kept giving him money from Grand Hill to the young guys to Coach K, Jay, by everybody. I like just, he was getting like 35, 40 letters a week from, and I was just like, holy cow. So I looked over at a guy who, uh, one of the owners of the Marlins who went to St. John's. I go, hey, we got Mike Jamiski here. You went to St. John's with me. I go, I went to treatment. I ain't got one letter. I said, we got to do better at St. John's. Said, oh, well, good goodness. Well, I should have never said that. They gave me such a role at St. John's to help with the alumni. I was like, it is just not like, I would never look. This is St. John's. Today. I never go in here and I'm a St. John's. These are for the net colors of St. John's. Hey, hey, that's a hat. Ah! <laughs> My bad on this. We were on Zoom, uh, obviously, and at this point, G-Man flexes his muscle and shows a Duke Blue Devil tattoo. That's the real investment right there, okay? That's, That's the commitment, baby. Brotherhood. Yeah. Right that is a bleeding Duke <laughs> Blue. Anybody can get a hat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so what we did was uh, we went and hired his AD. That's the first job we did. We hired Duke's AD, the assistant AD, and we brought him up here, Mike Craig, and we was like, hey, man, help us be like they are down at Duke. And, uh, you know, they're just the brotherhood they have at Duke is just unbelievable. And uh, it's just, you know, it's it, 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 it's it's to have that support and, and just to see Coach K call every day. Oh, I didn't even know Adam Silver went to Duke. Did you? I did, yeah, yeah. 
But but you yeah, reminded me. I've forgotten when you mentioned it. Yeah. Now, now yeah, I, yeah, I put right it together. Over my head, you know? I'm yeah. like, wow. Because when we play Duke at the Garden, I never understood how in the same How is there some more Duke people than St. John? Right. Yeah. How in John Wayne's ass is there more people for, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, at the Garden for Duke? Remember, but, remember Jay said the guys at the front of the bus run the world? <laughs> oh, shit. We all sat at the front of the bus. <laughs> 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 so so jay what was it like for you when you get those calls from adam silver you know you're helping a lot of people now what is it like for you to be on the other end of those calls i mean you know you you are constantly i don't want to say putting out fires because you're really giving right. people opportunities but right. i imagine you're getting calls all the time calls you're not talking about right. uh you know you're an outspoken guy but i'm sure you're very humble in this regard well, you know, sometimes you're putting out fires, but most of the time you're trying to get that fire back into people because they mm. have given up on life. You know, um, and one of the biggest things that give me peace in this world peace, is when people can depend on you. So, you know, being a coach in the NCAA would be nice, but when somebody calls me and says, hey, Jay, can you take care of my loved one? I care about my kid. I care about my mother. I care about my daughter, my son. Then they send you their most precious. Um, and they're depending on you. And that's what brings it out to me. You know, I don't know if I can do that. And as much as I love St. John's and the Big East, I, and I can do that for a game every day. Every day here, I got to bring it. I got to bring it because somebody's life's on the line. And, good, and guess what? Mike's saving my life. This place rebound is saving my life. You know, so I'm here every day, seven days a week, because I choose to be. This is a society that I have built through the grace of God. We go to church on Sundays. We have Curtis Martin who teaches a conversation here with us on Wednesdays to keep us, you know, on track with the Bible. And, and then look, that guy right there, up there, you know, makes all this happen, makes all this go around. We have the psychiatrists and psychologists and all these other guys. But really what it is, it's, it, it's the passion. We call it, nobody says we're going to work. Nobody checks the clock here. It's the passion we're going to every day. Talk to me about a day, like, like walk me through a day. At rebound okay. for people who are curious, they're, you know they're gonna they're just like a college recruit. They want they're gonna put right. their loved one in your hands. Well, I'm gonna tell you the difference. At at, at Duke, they're not gonna tell you the truth uh, <laughs> when they come to recruit. At St. John's, they're gonna tell you the truth. All right, so at, 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 you're gonna get up early here. You're getting up early. Okay. There's two buses, right? One leaves at 4:44, and the other one leaves at 7 a.m. And they go to the gym, right? Yeah, go to the gym. So you're on the, you go to the gym, and then we all go to breakfast together. After breakfast, you come back. For well, about 15 minutes, you get whatever we're doing. So if we're going scuba diving that way, that day you're getting your suit, you're getting everything ready, you're going scuba diving. Uh, that would take us from around 10 o'clock to right around about 1.30, and then we have lunch. And then now we all lunch out also. So we're still out, right? And then we get back in probably around... 2.15, and at 2.15, they got about 45 minutes to shower, and then we start our groups, and our groups are outside. Everything is outside mm. because, look, sleep deprivation is a big reason. He, you and I do what we do, right? Yeah. You know, we, we get sleep, we try this, we don't, our tempers are short, we, you know, we don't, you, you got to regroom it. It takes 66 days to break a bad habit, so we like to keep them here, but then after group and after individuals, I went to a place that I individual. 30 days, you get individual every day. Um, so we really work at it here. And then in the evening time, uh, we cook here, we eat here, we order out here, we stay here. But one of the things is we don't keep in the ball after 30 days, you've just seen this place and you haven't been in a restaurant. You haven't been, so what happens when you haven't been in a restaurant? As soon as we drop you off at the airport to go back to your family, um, to make sure that environment is safe, which we go up and we check to make sure that, that the family understands what we're bringing back to them and how to deal with them. Um, you get to the airport, the first thing you smell is beer. You're right. Mm -hmm. Today you start, you know, you know, you, um, and what we do here is we make sure it's real life. So we're driving through the bad neighborhoods. We see the dope man. We see people going into the doctor, the, the pill mills. We see that we see the alcoholics at the, at the places that we eat when we get dressed up on Saturdays to go out. Um, we're really a family here. And one thing Mike would tell you is that we really are, we don't get any easy cases, but we pick who we get, we want because these, this person, this teammate that's coming in is going to be with us for the rest of their life. So we want to make sure that we don't have people in here, um, who, uh, 
not going to be able to maintain that. Understand, I'm not going to say that anybody, I'm not going to say I'm never going to do this again, not making a psychopath. Um, but we want the people that come in here who's going to give it their best shot every single day. And that's what we get uh, here at Rebound. How, how is it like, you know, I tell people, you know, I'm 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 a 12 step guy, but but I but I was big in I still am big into working out. I right. remember I remember going to treatment and uh, I was like, hey, can I go running? And they were like, no. I was like, what? You know, and it was one of those things where I we could only go running three days a week, and I never quite got that. But I you know I bought in. I, I just I, right. I was all in because I needed to be. I, I had no other place to go. I had the gift of desperation, right? right. But I do talk about the camaraderie I get. Uh, with guys, especially like the men's meeting, it's almost like it's almost like a locker room, and it seems. Right. And you guys know better than anybody. You talk to any ex-athlete, anybody. What do they miss the most? They miss the camaraderie. They miss the guys. And a lot of times, that is intoxicating in a healthy way, right? right. That bond, and it seems like you guys are fostering that bond am- am- among these 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 teammates. That uh, that gives us what we need to go out there and face the stuff you're talking about and do it with flying colors, right? It's about living life, man. And AA is the only game in town. So, you know, it is the only game in town. But you know what? We really get a chance, like Mike was saying before, to know people really well in their comfort zone when they're out of it. You know, um, like I said, we could be having this conversation you know, on the couch, very comfortable. Here, you know, uh, today we're going to uh, go horseback riding. You know, when you put somebody on a horse, dude, you say oh, we're going horseback riding. I, I get my, 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 I get puckered up. I'm like, Shh, I, I'm too big. I can't. I literally am starting to think about excuses of why I can't go on the horse. Right, right. No, yeah. 100%. I'm yeah. allergic. I got this. <laughs> uh, uh, my back, whatever. You know, but but you're getting on that horse every year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things is that, you know, and, and when we pick them up, because I pick up every single teammate from the airport, and then when we pick them up from the airport, they always talk the tough talk, you know, because they're still drunk, they're still high. And, you know, oh, I ain't worried about no skydiving. I ain't worried about this. Oh, I'm only going to need one day in detox and this and that. And then they call me detox. Oh, you know, this place, I want to really get to the outdoor venture therapy. But they're physically not ready, Pete. So yeah. what do we do? We tell them, so they go, Jay, what are we doing today if I left today? What would be outdoor venture therapy? Because that's what they're missing. When I say skydiving, and they go, oh, uh, okay, and they go back and talk to the doctor. They stay another two or three days and get stronger. <laughs> you know, but, the tough but, guys. You know, you know, when you pick them up, they're all that so you know studio gangster talk. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's uh, it's a, it's a fun program. It's never the same day twice. A lot of laughing, but more crying than anything. Uh, and it's a brotherhood, like camaraderie. That I say that I can't say St. John's because we're in the rebuilding phase of, of that. Um, but Duke, you know, I'm going to say it's Duke like uh, in family style. And uh, I learned a lot of that from Mike. And uh, like, this is a, a great place to come get better and be a part of a family for the rest of your life. A couple more things, uh, real quick. I just want to give you guys an opportunity to talk about when people actually do physically leave. What, right. what do you got? Obviously, you keep in touch with them the video calls, but what do you suggest that they do for, for a long-term recovery? What, what, where do you guys move them towards? How does that go? Oh, I, you know, and I'll speak to, you know, my process, Pete, that in, to me, aftercare is essential when you first leave here. And, and what we do and what they did for me was I was going back to Charlotte. They contacted a couple of places that do uh, IOP, intense outpatient, um, and I had something lined up when I went back home, I still had a month or two before I actually got right back into my broadcasting and was actually seeing the game a lot more clearly than I was the prior <laughs> four or five years. Um, but I, you know, I, I went and I got this group and it was during COVID still. So it was, it was over zoom. Um, but I did, uh, I did IOP and, uh, from September until February. And then had a, a meeting with my, my therapist there, and they felt like I was in a good place to just continue, you know, to make that next step without that. But it, that's, that is so critical. You don't just leave here after 30, 60, 90 days, and that's it. You know, the aftercare is, is massive, along with what they do here. And that, you know, that video stuff, it's, it's a Marco Polo thread that sure. we're on. Um, okay. And every day. Every day, every one of us is on it, and it keeps us all accountable. And 
that accountability outside of here is, is huge. Mike, yeah. what, what what drew you back? I, I I talked about it. You got options, dude. What drew you back to rebound? I felt, Pete, I, I wanted to, I felt my calling was to be of service. Um, you know, I found if Christ suffered, washing the feet of his disciples. And that story resonates with me. This is God. This is the guy. And he is doing something that slaves do. Washing the feet, yeah. Yeah, he's going to die the next day for us. And I wanted to be of service. And I could not think of a better place. I called Jay and and Sean down here, and I said, look, I want to come and, and be a part on the other side of what you all do. And they were gracious enough to to make that happen. And this is my second summer down here. And it, it's been, we talk about Jay's thought. He said, he gets saved through this. I get saved doing what I'm doing here. It's just been, it's been a miraculous experience. Jay, anything else you want to say about, about rebound? I mean, I, I, it, it's just my passion, you know, um, it's my passion. It, uh, People always tell me, say, man, why, when are you going to come back from Florida? And uh, I said, you want me to come back to New York in February with gray sky, <laughs> snow, you know, nothing open but bars here. You know, here, there's something to do every day. Like, I, here, if you were to lay on the couch during the day, you would feel very guilty. You know, here is something, uh, you know, and look, they, people say, Jay, you haven't been on vacation in eight years. This is a vacation. You know, I'm going scuba diving, skydiving, I'm going horseback riding today. You know, we play racquetball. I go to the gym. I'm physically in great shape. I feel good, spiritually well. You know, you know, God is not good. God is awesome. Apple pie is good. Um, we got the best staff here, the best doctor, best everything. And I'm just, a, one thing about it, there is no staff splitting. We all so close. And, uh, you know, we really, truly, like, love helping people. And, uh, like, nobody comes in here and goes, Pete. All right, I'm gonna punch the clock today. I got to be somewhere at five o'clock. There's people here that come on their days off and bring their family here to hang out. And then we got some people that come through and they go, you know, I'm not wearing the rebound gear because everybody gets rebound gear and they go, I don't want to wear it. And that's their option. But you know, after about four or five days, they go, wow, this guy's a legit. You know, they really do care. And I'm gonna be a part of this family. I'm gonna represent. They throw in their rebound gear and they're out there with us. And now they're part of the family. And that's something that's gonna be for, with us for the rest of our life. So people always say why we're so successful down here is because we pick and choose. I can tell you right now, this was not an easy case. <laughs> but, you know, so you know, we don't have any easy cases. What we do is we pe- we take people over positions. You know, if you got a good heart and you want to get better uh, and you need some motivation or you need to be humbled, um, I'm just a warning or an example to people. One of the two or both. Sometimes I'm a warning and an example to people for all the stuff that I've been through, and I would share my stories with them. And I, I, I can't thank you enough. You just cut up on me a little bit there, uh, but, but I, I, you guys, for me to be able to talk to Mike Jaminski and Jason Williams about sobriety uh, is kind of gets me a little emotional. It's, it's just a total gift. I, I thank you guys for what you're doing, Jason. Thank you so much. Uh, you're you're just an example. You guys both, like I said at the beginning, you guys are just oozing this thing. You're glowing, uh, and uh, that is. And Pete, what do you hear right there? Is is the airplane? We didn't bring this up. We also do takeoff and landing. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, we have a Cessna 182 down here. So Mike's <laughs> now a pilot. So you know, not only yeah. scuba dive certified, but also a pilot and a jockey. As much as much as he he's a vein looks like an out of work jockey, but he's a jockey, right? Hey, Tom Cruise got nothing on this place down here. <laughs> got a whole bunch of Mavericks floating around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pete, thank you for what you do. Thank you for bringing attention to the cause, man. Yeah. You know, and lifting the stigma. And thanks, man. And uh, let's get together when you come down this way. And uh, let's catch a St. John's game. And uh, I'll, I'll root for St. John's to beat, beat the show yeah. Duke any day. It doesn't matter. We're used to being double team. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Grayson. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank Thank you right. Mike. Appreciate it. Here you go. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that.
This has been a Rogue Media Network production.